Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Oh, you got it. Okay, we're live. Thank you, folks. Um, this is the first time I've uh, given a lecture here in the United States in probably nine years. Um, a lot of what you're going to see here today is a um, first-time release uh, worldwide of technologies and secrets. Uh, it is time. And so I am going to um, teach you some things here on this, uh, this board about the cover-up that has been mentioned before in some of the lectures uh, about the alien cover-up and about some of our own human-based programs to make anti-gravity and various other technologies. I don't want this to be a dull and boring lecture. And the opening montage you saw covers uh, scenes from everything we're going to try to squeeze into an hour. If it goes over your head or you forget things, don't worry. Uh, they're recording it on a DVD, and I planned on this. What we're presenting here is going to go far and wide, not just here in Roswell. It's the beginning of an unveiling. You saw the blue and red satin magician's cape. We're pulling the lid off of a number of things today. I didn't even tell Guy, um, organizing this, what exactly we were going to do because I didn't want it to leak out anywhere. In this country, in the early, uh, or sorry, the late parts of World War II, about 1943, there were a number of programs other than the Manhattan Project that were started to develop weapons to defeat Germany. We knew at that time that Germany was going to try to get an atomic bomb and uh, certainly the effort was thwarted. But there were other projects. And Dr. Edward Teller, the um, kind of alleged uh, father of the hydrogen bomb project, um, recruited myself and a number of other people uh, from the mid-50s forward until 1971. I was recruited in 71, a latecomer to the program. But back in those early days, there was a, a real problem with removing the blinders off of um, scientists uh, to develop new weapons uh, and new defensive mechanisms as well. So in 1943, the, the men developing this project tried to figure out a way to convince scientists that certain things like anti-gravity 
uh, new types of weapons where possible to remove the blinders. So by 1952, they had already started what I'm going to show you here. But um, uh, this is where, whoops, this is where it happened. Can you hear me? Can, uh, is this uh, mic on here? Only for the video. Sorry, folks. All right. I, I, I will project without popping my peas. Thank you. We hope so. All right. Uh, in 1947, Jesse Marcel was uh, heavily ridiculed over uh, the uh, release of the information that we had a, um, a flying saucer down. I must tell you that they were Air Force officers. They were officers of the 509th Bomb Wing, and they, these are the guys that did the atomic bomb testing. They weren't stupid. They knew the difference between a kite and pieces of metal and bodies and things that were real. It wasn't crash dummies. It, it wasn't uh, alfoil and scotch tape and balsa wood. He was duped into setting up for that photo there in Fort Worth. Now, he took a lot of flack. His son defends him today. But this is where it started here at Roswell Army Airfield. 1947. Little time warp sound effects there. <laughs> now, you've all heard of, of Jesse Marcel, but you would not have heard of, of oops, sorry, of Colonel Harrison there. Let's see if I can get back to him. Yeah, all right, all right. I've got a twitchy finger on this thing here. Let me just uh, get in there. Okay. Now, Colonel Harrison died uh, last, uh, well, in 2003 now. He lived in Fort Worth. Uh, he was the next-door neighbor of uh, an acquaintance of Holly Mine and, who works for Lockheed. Colonel uh, Harrison was a co-pilot on the first atomic bomb test dropped in Bikini Atoll. He received the Distinguished Flying Cross. He uh, was a lifelong friend, as you can see here, of the, uh, from the wartime days till, till he died, of the McCain family, Senator McCain and uh, Admiral McCain. He also served as a special assistant to Admiral uh, McCain at a very top-level security position. He's one of the guys that was truly a secret keeper. And he did it even from his son until the day that he died. As it turns out, uh, Colonel Harrison was outside the back of his um, apartment, slipped and fell and hurt his head to the point that it uh, was a cerebral hemorrhage. They took him to the hospital and he lingered for a while. And his son was in there with him just before his dad died. And he said, Dad, I've got to know, were the aliens real? Because this guy was here at Roswell and a number of paper uh, trails led to his plane, his plane ID for having ferried parts back to uh, Fort Worth and over to um, Wright Pat. And he turned to his son and he said, all I will say is that they were real. And he died a few minutes later. So you have another witness, hearsay, but one of the kind that really counts because he was a very special fella. He flew the B-47s, the early Strategic Air Command, and he also uh, commanded a B-52 Air Wing uh, under Curtis LeMay in the SAC uh, program after that. 509th there was the start of that. And there's his distinguished flying cross. Now, this is Raymond F. Jones. Who's Raymond F. Jones? This island Earth, one of the two probably classic uh, Hollywood productions about alien invasions of Earth in the 50s, the other being The Forbidden Planet. Raymond Jones wrote this and 74 other stories. Raymond was a, a Mormon and um, an, avid, uh, an avid imagination, but he also ran in some very interesting circles. And so after he had uh, started and finished this particular book, which became the movie, he wrote a short story called no Noise Level for this magazine, 1952. I came across the story in 1977 in this reprint done in England. I'm going to tell you a short praise of this story because it's going to probably answer a number of things for you eventually. In the story that Raymond wrote, Noise Level, there's a meeting called in the Pentagon. 
the chiefs of staff all come to the meeting and there's a president's representative there and there's this big table. In the middle of the table there's this plastic wrapped bunch of burned junk. And it was sealed up airtight, you know, tied off anyway. And the president's aide tells the assembled scientists and professors who've been called in from all the United States and the, and the generals, he said, look, I know you're not going to believe what we're about to tell you, but something extraordinary happened last week and we need your help to solve the mystery. He said, we have some of it on film. We were testing this young fellow's device. Um, he's kind of a smart aleck, uh, but uh, we were testing it last week with him and here's the film we took. And so they open up the curtain and the film starts. And you see this young, kind of red-haired, freckle-faced scientist looking smart aleck, you know, really a bright genius type. And he's got this little chest pack and a backpack and a little belt, and he's standing in front of some of the generals there in, in a football stadium. And he reaches down, he pushes a button, and he lifts up off the deck two or three feet and just stands there in the air. Nobody says a word in the office there in the Pentagon. They're thinking, wow, okay, so he's been lifted up a bit. Then he pushes another button and he rotates sideways and lifts up about 40 feet and takes off, flies around the football field and comes back around for a low pass over the generals. Everybody ducks and there's a puff of smoke. Quick explosion, he nose dives into the deck and dies, a ball of flame. The package on the table holds the remains of the guy's instrument, what's left after the fire melted everything together. He said, gentlemen, he died before he told us how he did it. This guy doesn't work for any government. He's just an individual. He doesn't have any university grants. He's just an individual, and he did this. Now, you've got to figure out how he did it. We've got his apartment. We've got his library. We've got his lab. We've got everything. You go and take his notes apart and figure out how he did this. Well, yeah, well, everybody runs over a you know, big gaggle to this guy's apartment. They look through his library. He's got chemistry here, physics here, philosophy, uh, ancient mysticism, uh, everything and he's got a lathe room and, and, and downstairs in the second floor area here and then he's got over here he's got uh, biochemistry and all kinds of stuff and they said could one guy have read all of this and they start looking through some of the volumes and there's notes annotations in the margins well where are his other notes couldn't find him weeks and months passed as they puzzled over how he did it and groups all over the United States for like Martin Marriott and some of the other larger corporations had scientists gathered together trying to figure out how did he do it. One guy was out fishing, one of the scientists, and he's throwing his line into the water. And as it hit, ripples went out and there was this swirling vortex next to a rock. And he saw how the splashing water moved some twigs that came together, pulled in by the vortex and stuck together. He says, I've got it. I understand gravity now. They went running back, and a month later, they rang the guys at the Pentagon and said, we've done it. It's 30 feet in diameter, and it's about a foot thick, and it weighs 15 tons, and it only moves off the floor an inch, but we've got anti-gravity. Well, the Pentagon said, get your notes, get over here quick. Everybody is reassembled into the Pentagon in the same room. They show the film of the test to all the other guys who weren't there, and they say, wow, fantastic. The guy that called the meeting said, gentlemen, I want you to meet someone. Very special. Curtain opens and out comes the red-headed scientist, the dead one. And they said, what is this? And they said, well, he's an actor. He never existed as we told it to you. We had to remove the noise level from your mind to say that it is possible to get you to work on it. <laughs> now, I tell you this for a reason. Two streams of events have been following the UFO circumstance, the real alien or fallen ones strain, chain, and the one where the nozzle has been removed in certain scientists' minds to get them to develop this. We have developed anti-gravity. I was recruited way after they got it for the first time because I came up with a method of um, powering a saucer craft using an ionized air plasma, which I'll explain to you later. In that program, under Dr. Teller, I was sent down to Australia. And so I've been privy to things you would never see. You would never, ever see. And I'm going to show you some of those things as best I could re recreate them today so that you'll understand that mankind has, on his own accord, done some of this. Now, before the alien card was played or begun in 1947, it was kicked around in Washington that in addition to removing the noise level, 
after World War II was over, there was going to have to be some sort of a plan devised to stop warfare. We could not afford, the human race could not afford another warfare with the technology of the stage it was. Any of you that have brothers and sisters, as children you can remember when you were in your room fighting at night probably, and your dad said, stop, or I'm coming in with the belt. <laughs> That he meant business, yeah, probably, until you heard the knock at the door. And when the door ripped open and there was the eight foot wide belt with meat cleavers on it and said, I'm going to kill you, you knew you, you were friends again. You and your brother or sister were friends. And, ah, hey, Dad, no problem. We are that way. Russian, Chinese, American, Canadian. We are the fighting siblings, all humans. Well, majority of us anyway to get us together long enough to try peace, to get along in harmony, it was reason that they could not coerce us from any philosophical or political point. They could not force us with a dictatorship. So they were going to fool us into thinking we were being invaded without knowing that we had aliens at the time. The best laid plans go astray. In 1947, there was a crash. And there were alien beings on that crash. Even though I wasn't there, I'm convinced from what I was shown inside the organization. Certainly there were some technologies, and probably still are some remaining, that we were not able to back engineer. But some very interesting things did surface. Noise level, eh? Yeah, we don't want that. Okay. Now, to help you understand gravity, I'm doing this for a reason. There have been people that have talked about anti-gravity, some magic thing and this kind of stuff, and it's a very simple thing in concept. But I'm going to use graphics and some animations and some films of some of the tests we've done to explain gravity to you. So you understand then how anti-gravity can be made and was made, and will not be surprised when you see this upon you shortly out in the open there is a real severe deception in the works, not entirely mankind's doing. Remember me telling you about noise level, guy out fishing and seeing the vortex and the little spin and stuff. What we see here is just a simple water drop. But I've put this up to show you how when the water drops, it splashes out, makes a large radius first ring, then smaller ones, smaller ones out like that. And then the reflection of its splash pops up a ball in the air like that. Okay, big deal, you've seen that. Now, what happens next is you will see if you take one splash, it sets equally, almost equally spaced crowns out like this. These are inertial things formed by water pressing on itself to make little beadlets out here like one single drop would do. This happens usually on a flat surface instead of a deep amount of water. Now, for the astronomers in the crowd. What we see here is a splash which can represent the sun. Then there's the first orbit of some planet, and the second and the third. But if you're an astronomer, you notice that those rings, the radii of them, do not match our planets. You think, well, this couldn't be explaining gravity and orbits of planets. But it does. Because in space, you don't have an infinite pond where the ripples just go out and don't come back. Space has mass and resistance. It's like a very fine fluid. It's so fine that atoms are made up of a lot of it. It's called ether space in James Clerk Maxwell's day last, or century before last, and we have returned to that understanding of the way the world works. When you take a bucket of paint, thick paint, and you put your paint stirrer on your drill and you stick it down in and spin it around, it will make circular waves go out and hit the edge of the paint bucket and then come back to your spinning paint stirrer, to the little rod. If you spin it at the right speed for that can, the wave will go out, reflect back in, just in time to be in phase with the next spin wave coming out from your spinning rod. This is called standing waves or harmonics. When that happens, then the spacing of the rings changes. And when it does, you can have a planet and a moon, like the Earth and the moon right there, following 
this particular orbit. Notice how there are bands of orbits. We have those in our own solar system with the Jovian lighter density pla uh, planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn where they have uh, a large mass hump like this uh, that would be out in this area here. Here down in our zone is a different set of rings but they all follow what's called um, a hyperbolic or an exponential curve uh, as, as far as their distance from the sun like this. It's a very nice curve. But it's a sum of two things, two waves. The sun is spinning at high speed and it spins out a bunch of rings. They reflect from space itself because it's spinning so fast the sun is. And the waves reflect back and where they cross and add together forms an orbit. And a planet has to orbit in one of those or it breaks up. Like the asteroid belt it used to be a planet. But now it's broken up and pieces of it are on the surface of Mars, a lot of red dust and uh, a 600 mile diameter chunk of that, uh, either a moon or the planet itself in that orbit is broken up on the surface of Mars near the Cydonia area where people think there's a, a face and that's a farce. Gravity can be determined with a telescope looking at distant star systems. How can you see gravity? Because scientists, astronomers have found that as a star spins, it's originally spherical, but as it spins, it starts to flatten at the poles. And this is called oblateness. It's not totally round, it's oblate flattening. When that happens, they measure the number of degrees of off true circle, that is, and they say, ah, its gravitational constant is such and such because it is so flattened. The more it flattens, the higher the gravitational constant. What they're telling you is this. Gravity has to have spin around some center or you don't have gravity. So you say, well, why is that? It's because gravity is not a one-way force. It's the result of two forces acting. You spin out diverging waves. They reflect back converging. And where they cross partially or entirely, the directions either cancel entirely or are more in favor of this way or that way. In essence, gravity will reverse in orbits and not all be pointed at the sun. In between orbits, there are null zones. There are zones where the, the forces net more that way out away from the solar system than toward the center. On the Earth, if you were to drill a hole all the way down to the center and drop a rock, it wouldn't go to the center of the Earth. It would go down a fixed distance and bounce back up, not to the surface, but probably 150, 200 miles below, and find its equilibrium point. There are layers or shells of inertia that form gravity. Spin. Have I lost everybody? Now, I don't have stock in Coca-Cola, but I sure use them a lot. This is, this is the top, you'll see this in action in a minute. This is the top of a, a mm, two liter bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, I've developed a process of generating planets and stars with sound waves on the surface of Coca-Cola bottle, with Coke in it, of course. Um, oh, Dr. Pepper worked as well, uh, so if you're listening, Dr. Pepper. Um, what you'll notice there is, is a depression. <laughs> that was a strong hint, wasn't it? Uh, what you'll notice here is a depression on the surface of this liquid. Now, in school, you're taught this is um, surface tension that holds that little bead up. If you've watched rain fall down in a puddle closely, you'll see that splashes will hit a puddle and little tiny bubbles or, or spheres will dart around very quickly on the surface and then be absorbed and disappear. And they tell you, well, that's because momentarily the surface tension of the, of the puddle kept that raindrop from actually falling through the surface. That's not exactly correct. As I showed you earlier with the drops, the splashes, when a drop is formed up like that and spins like that in the air, it is spinning, it is convecting like a mushroom cloud around an atom bomb. You don't see it here, but that, that little drop of Coca-Cola there is spinning like that at high speed. But if you do nothing except generate that and then stand back from the Coke bottle, about mm, 15, 20 seconds later, it will just reabsorb into the surface, pop and disappear. But if you add sound to it, which we'll show you in a minute, you can keep reinforcing that spin and have it there indefinitely as a planet or a star or just a bubble on a Coke bottle, whatever you want to call it. But this is showing the same effect Einstein's equations predicted about the warping 
of the time-space fabric. That's the best way they could describe it. But you are seeing here, you're actually seeing it. Instead of an equation, you're seeing it. See what I'm saying? All right. Now, I'll pause on this for about 10 seconds. <laughs> this, yeah, okay. This, this equation here is the one I use to generate what you're going to see in a minute. There's um, a yellow, a green, and a red equation, and these are the, the uh, constants I plugged into those. To show you how the divergent wave and the convergent wave add together to give you the yellow thing. Now I put this up primarily for the people who are going to see this D DVD elsewhere who are of that bent to show that this is the first approximation of the equation, definitely not the equation for our solar system, but close. Okay? All right. Now this is something that I will play again for you. Here is one waveform, that big hump that we saw at the beginning, and another one just like it moving in. In our solar system, like all stellar systems, the center of the sun is not in one place. They're, they're separated by a, a number of miles. It's called an elliptical orbit, and there are two centers to the orbit, and so the sun actually rotates around two points like a parabola. When you get them real close together like they are, these waves start to add together. Yeah. I got to cheat here for a minute. Where is my... Okay, let's try this and see what happens here. Okay. You see how they added together and form that big hump? I'll do that one more time. The two waves add to form a taller hump than the first one. Okay, this is wave addition. Now here are those equations in moving form. The bottom ones are the two reference ones, so the divergent and convergent, and the one in the middle, or the one at the top, the yellow one, is the resulting orbits, which can be uh, vastly different than a normal uh, series progression or uh, exponent or hyperbolic curve. Let me just do this again. Look at this. See these, ring, these uh, ripples here? Now here is one that's only about um, nine-tenths uh, uh, separated from that uh, uh, by its, its frequency. And this would be the sun in the center, and these would be orbits of planets. Well, now, here you see two humps. They're not quite a line, and two more, they're not quite a line. But when you add them together, an orbit almost disappears. Now, why is this important? As our star starts to slow down, which all stars do as they die, the rings around them where planets can orbit change, and orbits get canceled, and it's like, hey, you can't park here anymore. And that's why we think Venus, only one of our planets that doesn't have what's called a magnetosphere or plasmosphere, and it rotates backwards to everybody else, we think Venus either came in from an outer orbit or uh, out of the solar system and as an interloper in a temporary orbit. Okay. Okay, this is going to annoy you for a minute. This is sound waves around 110 cycles, somewhere in that range. I'll, uh, it varies as I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going to show you how we have the, um, the bubble formed, and then at the very end, there's going to be a very quick flash. You will see two large spheres on the coke surface and a little tiny one coming in and then suddenly bouncing away like crazy. This doesn't happen because of surface tension. This happens because their spins are opposite. The little guy has got a spin that goes out like this. The big guy has one that, that comes the other direction. And so when they get close to each other, they bounce off. Not magic, not electrostatics, but just pure movement. Notice in this, that would be the sun, and this would be a planet. What is happening is the speaker, I've got on the table, you'll see that in a second as it, it moves down the shot. The speaker is generating a wave in the side of the bottle that is reinforcing this one here and keeping it alive. It is feeding it inertia, waves, like planets get fed. And this is generating one of those 
balls. It'll pop up here in the lower right corner. Okay. There's no magic to gravity. It is motion in a fluid space. It is spin around a center or two centers as the case may be. If you apply that to a saucer craft, you're going to see the following things. First of all, a single anti-gravity craft, I'll get to the details of how that works in a minute, but the craft itself has to have spin in its field. Even a plasma craft, which is charged air at high temperature, which moves through a magnetic field, forms a spinning tornado with the center of it right down the middle of the craft, that was the early days, and uh, up and out over the surface wing and back in to form a convecting smoke ring. When it does that, it's just like when you run your hand through the tub like this or down a stream. As you move this way, in opposition to the movement of your hand, there's anti-curl going the opposite direction to conserve momentum. The energy you're putting into the water spins behind you, a turbulent wake in a boat or whatever. Now, the little green circles you're gonna see here are an example of a craft generating secondary spin vortices around it in air, space, water, wherever it's operating. Craft in the middle, the white thing, the counter spin vortices outside. They won't touch each other because they are going in opposite directions between them. Look at that again. Notice that these arrows are in opposite directions. If they were to get too close, they'd push themselves apart like those two drops you saw on the surface of that Coca-Cola. Boy, Coke's gonna owe me a favor. Okay, now, if they got too close to each other, even as a craft rather than secondary eddies, watch what happens, oops. Both of those circles were spinning in the same direction, but they'll bounce apart. Look at that again. Both spinning in the same direction, but in between them, no. However, there's a trick to this. The gap theory. Nothing to do with Genesis, but anyway. <laughs> okay, if you space them correctly, they will actually lock together with a common shared vortex in between them like that. Watch that again. Now, it's fairly unstable with just two of them like this, as they tend to kind of orbit. Okay. Now, if I let them free wheel in space, two ships using that, this is what they'll do. They'll spin around and you have a hard time controlling them. So, we go to a stable form, which is three and more in triangular additions. Okay, they will lock together. They won't go any closer like a flock of birds. They will lock together like that in those formations. Now, you've seen reports or films or, you know, movies even showing UFOs gathering like this and locking together like a flock of birds even in the 50s over the White House. This is why they did that, because it is efficient and uh, as they get together in triangular pieces and make bigger and bigger formations, it is easier for them to conserve energy, to communicate with each other because the fields between them, the, the, the vibrating fields, are mechanical and you can talk between the ships without going to radio just by using the vibration in the field. You can actually shout if you wanted to. Uh, it wouldn't be as efficient, but it's modulating with just voice level audio. When these craft get together like that, if you wanted to, you could, you could stretch a, well, a blimp, a fake flying saucer of any shape you want over the top of it and under the bottom of it and snap the edges shut and the guy on the ground is going to say, wow, look at that 450 foot long UFO. But if you take the cover off, it's you know, 10, 12, 15 of these guys all hooked together. Now, modern physicists, when approached with the problem of supporting a craft in the air for 10 minutes or more in one spot, right here, I've, I've debated some of them, the heads of theoretical physics in universities, and I've managed to frustrate every one of them. They say, well, ugh, 10 minutes, the amount of fuel you need, I mean, look at the space shuttle for crying out loud. You, you couldn't sit right there for 10 minutes. Or you couldn't carry enough fuel on board. 
I say, well, hmm, you got a blackboard? You see this little basket here and these little wires and stuff? And this is a hot air balloon over the top of it here. You see where I'm going with this? See, this guy's been here three hours sitting here with a hot air balloon. Well, that's different. That's different. That's uh, specific gravity. Uh, it, it, that has nothing to do with this. I said, well, now why does that balloon float? Because the hydrogen gas in it is less dense but more energetic you know, per particle? Yeah. Okay, so in other words, if I could magically generate a field in and around a craft using normal air or something else that was just like hydrogen but contained, then I could float that thing there because it's not, the energy's not going where it's contained in the field. <laughs> I had one guy get some many picked chalk off his desk and threw it at me and stomped out the door. <laughs> but, but it's there, that's the truth. Now, so when you see a large ship, if you do, I mean a large ship, like half a mile in diameter or something, and you have an engineer tell you, it can't be real. If it is, it's not from around here because, you know, half a mile long lever arm on a wing or a portion of it, if that thing moved up and down like that, it'd rip the thing apart just from, you know, the, the lever action on the joints. What they haven't considered, very simple point, what I showed you there with those, the, the, the saucers gathering together to make a bigger craft, each one of them still has its own local gravity. And the stretch would only be 30, 40, 50 feet, and we do more than that on a, a standard uh, airliner wing. So when you have gravitational posts all through this immense structure, uh, and it's all linked together, and the command pilot that's linked them all together and, and firing the system, everything accelerates uniformly. There's no big drama. There's no heavy torque on the joints. It is possible, and within the realm of modern physics. It's just that you didn't see how Houdini did it, and that's what we're playing with. Some will be real and some will be a Trojan horse, I'm sure. And this is what you would um, probably see. That was neat. Got to have one. As Will Smith's head, I think, what was it, in, in Fourth of July? I've got to get me one of these. <laughs> in Batman, didn't he? Okay. In 19, well, in the late 50s, in Strategic Air Command, um, there was a friend of mine uh, who was a colonel. Um, he became a friend of mine later. A colonel in the Air Force, and he was a commander of a SAC aircraft, a bomber aircraft. And um, Colonel Dice um, had a navigator on board that uh, he knew quite well. Younger fellow, obviously, captain, I think. And one day the captain came to me and says, uh, Colonel, he says, look, I'm going to give you a sealed envelope here, and I want you to hold it for me. I've got a duplicate that uh, I have at home, and I've filed another one that's in, in mail that's coming to me, certified mail, but I want you to keep a copy until I tell you otherwise. And George said, well, what's in it? And he said, well, I did something at home the other night, an experiment I've been playing with that is absolutely astounding. And I'm going to tell you this, and the drawings and the plans for it are in this envelope, and it's real. And he said, I, I went into the, the garage there where I was setting this up, and I had some chipboard, um, compressed board, what do you call it here? You know, particle, particle board, yeah. Uh, look, I was in Australia so long that I get my, my terms confused. I do apologize, so you'll have to give me credit for that anyway. And he said, I put three levels, like a cake, of particle board together, and I put some washers and coils on it and some rods, which we're going to look at here. And he said, I hooked it up to the, uh, the uh, signal generator set there, the, the frequency. And um, I fired it up and nothing happened. And I thought, surely I would see some magnetic effects from it. And he said, all of a sudden, it started to lift up off the, the workbench, just slowly lifting up. And he said, I was amazed. And I, wow, what have I got here, you know? And it started to lift up a little bit further. And he said, wow, look, at the air is kind of yeah, mottled gray and kind of, yeah, yeah. wow. Oh, if I stick my hand in, I want to feel hurt. Hmm, I'll grab this broomstick. It's not conductive. Ah, it feels like jello you're going through. Wow, it's a field. Well, I'll just turn that off. We'll do that again. He reaches over here to these knife clips he's got for the power supply, and he pulls it back like this, and it goes, <laughs> and a big arc, double arc jumps over and gaps the air and keeps on running the spark in the air without this thing. He says, oh, dear, can't, can't shut it off. 
And he said, um, hmm, <laughs> well, and he takes this broom handle and goes whack like that and hits this gray area under the, the uh, floating thing. Well, then it all stopped, but it was a huge electrical discharge. Down the pole, up into the mains, blew the power transformer on the block, oh, no. and, well, <laughs> power company came out the next day. Darn this thing, he said, I, I don't know what has happened. I was sitting out here watching TV, and it just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he had anti-gravity. So he gave this to George, and George told me about it years later. I said, George, where is that envelope? This is before I left to work with Teller's Group. So I, my mom and dad moved to Florida. I think it's in my boxes there. I said, well, did you ever open it? He said, no. I said, well, what happened to the navigator? He said, oh, you know, come to think of it, a few weeks after that, he was transferred out. I never saw him again. I thought, small wonder. All right, so I filed that away. Then. Well, probably a few months later, I was recruited by Teller's Group, and I got to see why what the navigator did worked. Now, up there at the top left is how he wound one set of washer and rod. And then he put them into this on particle board. 15 degree spacing as we twisted the various layers apart. And when I was later into the real guys, this is the application of one of his coils and rods. And that's the inside of a 30 foot diameter human made anti-gravity craft. It's as simple as that. What I don't have here are some things that I will um, probably not show publicly for safety reasons, but I'll explain that. In the real craft, this coil here and this one come up over an archway here so as not to block the, what's called the breather of the washer. This is a hollow square sectioned mu metal inductor core. This is like one of those washers he had on his uh, particle board. See how it wraps around one washer? There's a little gap in it. Now for the coil going up the rod in the center, we have this one here and this one here. What he did was he used pulsed direct current to generate a spinning vortex right here in the fabric of space, if you wish, into the ether space. I'm gonna show you how that works in the next animation. But this, I promise you, is a 30 foot diameter craft drive coil. It produces a number of very interesting effects on the crew and the surrounding area by altering time. It's not a time machine, it just simply means that for people inside the field at various positions from the center and out, time passes at a different rate. While I'm on that subject very quickly, if you watch a hummingbird, or watch a bee, you'll see that they move a lot quicker than you can predict where they're going or try to catch one or a fly. These things operate at a higher operative neural rate than you and I do, yet they do function. They are simply looking at us as slow, sluggish, moving things, and they are just living five to ten times faster than us. With these craft, when the energy is pumped into this and into the superstructure and into the crew, all their atoms, all their molecules get extra energy and they become like the hydrogen atom in a hot air or a hydrogen balloon type thing. They become inertially lighter, but yet they are moving faster. So when they go to do one of these miraculous right angle turns at 10,000 miles an hour that are impossible, they have not violated the rules of physics at all. What they have done is they've said, uh, attention crew, we're gonna turn a corner uh, about 10,000 miles an hour here, prepare. And somebody in the crew says, okay, you got the cards? Yeah, okay, I'll get something to drink, get up a table. And they're now going to turn the corner. And it takes them five minutes, let's say, to turn that corner. But you on the outside see, Phew! that's impossible. It would rip apart. But it's not because everything in here is at a different energy density like that hummingbird. And they are being uniformly accelerated. And as they go around that corner, they're looking out the window, well, sometimes, and they're saying, oh, look, everybody's in slow motion. <sighs> And they lose 10 minutes of their life relative to you. Or they gain, sorry, they gain. They, in other words, they, they age at 10 minutes while you're only aging a fraction of a second. It's like when you were at the fairgrounds, the showgrounds, 
as a kid, they used to have this big cylinder that you'd uh, stand on and have a floor and it'd start to spin. Then all of a sudden, the floor would drop out and somebody across, you, you know, you'd all stick to the edge of it and spin sideways, stuck on the side of it. And somebody would usually, you know, wet their pants or something, get really excited uh, because there's no floor under them. But what it is, is the centrifuge effect is holding you up. Now, if you extrapolate that to a ball instead of a cylinder, and you have a ball with oil in it and another ball inside that, and you're inside that ball, and somebody pushes you off a 50-story building. I wouldn't try it, but anyway, hypothetically, what would happen is your double spheres with oil would hit the ground, bounce, you being inside that ball and, and lopsided because you're not, you, your weight's not uniformly distributed, would cause the inner ball to spin. And what would happen is it, the big ball on the outside would come to a rest in somebody's parking lot or something down there, and people would listen, they'd hear <laughs> going on inside. And after a few minutes, you in the inside spinning ball, like at the fairgrounds, would come to a stop. And what you have done is you've stretched out the period of time that you normally would take to crash into the dirt and kill yourself over several minutes, and that doesn't cause structural fatigue. When I was at the academy here, the Air Force Academy, uh, we used to do describe a crash of an aircraft as a landing in which the vertical component was reduced to zero in such a short period of time as to cause structural fatigue. <laughs> that wouldn't happen in this kind of a situation. These things are not only possible, they're being done. They've been done behind your back for very good reasons, which we'll certainly address before we get through here today. Now, do any of you um, ever recall in the um, late 50s, early 60s, um, it wasn't Dino Kraspadon, there was an, a, a science fiction writer, not a science fiction writer, a UFO investigator back then, mentioning the, the guy that knew the secret, the military guy named Lorenzo that knew the secret about the flying saucers. Do you remember that? Probably not. Well, anyway, it was a rumor in the UFO community back then that there was some guy that had the secret to anti-gravity that knew it, and he was in control of all this for the military, and his name was Lorenzo. Probably a captain or something, they weren't sure. It wasn't a Mr. Lorenzo. It was what is called a Lorenz, L-O-R-E-N-T-Z-O. -E what you just saw up here makes what is called a Lorenz O. The secret to the anti-gravity problem uh, or situation is the Lorenz O. Named after a mathematician, Lorenz, um, it uh, tells what happens when you have electricity going this way in a conductor and at the same time, you have electricity going around it to make like this in a different direction. In between them, a force appears, whether in air, water, whatever, and it's called the Lorentz force. And it tries to get these two conductors to line up. And if you don't let them, then the stress has to be uh, transferred to the medium you're in, out of gravity. Now this device here, I. Um, built to show people. We're going to see that little thing over here on the left animate and um, I'm going to show you a long quartz tube and inside it will be a copper um, pipe, a thin pipe of copper lining the inside of this tube and then I'm going to put a nail and a cork right down the middle of it and I'm going to take electricity from a electric arc welder, 1200 watts at about 60 volts and I'm going to shove that down through that nail, through some salt water, which is just tap water with a bit of salt, a couple of tablespoons of salt, and some hydrochloric acid to make it conductive. And it's gonna go through that water into this copper sheath, which is then connected to the other end of the copper tube back to the um, uh, electric arc welder. You'll see all this. I'm telling you beforehand so that uh, you can just contemplate what you're seeing. What you're gonna see at the end of all this is that scene right there where I have a copper tube with all this, um, and the glass tube with all this uh, water in it, sitting right down inside of two speaker magnets. You know, the back of your speakers, those round donut magnets? They have a north-south field running like this, which is the same as one of those washer coils that I was showing you before. And when I do that, and I just do nothing but pit, hit the power switch and electricity starts to flow down from that uh, nail you see at the top down to the copper, you're gonna see spin. 
and that's the beginning of the vortex tornado, the Lorentz O. And you can use that to make plasma craft and anti-gravity craft. You can also use it in water at lower temperatures to make very fast boats. That's when I was a little bit younger. Well, maybe a lot. There's your, um, well, that might be brass. I can't tell from the color it was brass or copper, just a conductor. Quartz too, because this gets very hot very quickly. Glove, obviously, to keep from burning myself again. There's your ring magnets. There's the uh, jar of water from the tap. Still water is better than you put a couple of tablespoons of salt and about, oh, half an ounce of hydrochloric or something in it. That's the company that made the uh, electric arc welder. That's a 100 amp diode down there which turns the alternating current into one direction, direct current. And there's the, the magic nail that goes down through the cork. I forget what we made that out of, but it was something that didn't melt easy. And here you go. No moving parts except the bubbles that form from the heat showing where the ions are traveling following the, the vortex field set up. And this occurs down the center of any of those craft. The next time you're sitting next to somebody blowing smoke rings, witness a miracle. The smoke ring can do some marvelous things. If you stand here in this room and put up, say, an elephant ear plant back there, you know, those big green ears floating like that, or a candle, a lit candle, and you went <laughs> as hard as you could huff and puff, you could not blow out the candle or move the big elephant ear back there, the plant. Yet, if you take a device that makes a smoke ring and you use the same amount of energy, probably less, and you aim it back there and you go like that, that little ring of energy, the same amount that you would have blown out and lost into oblivion out here, same amount in a tight little package goes right over there and blows out a candle or moves that target elephant ear like that. Now, in this test here, I've used slow speed, and some of it I've, I've done some time lap or some uh, slow mo camera stuff. But watch, as you see there, there's a smoke ring on the right, but behind it, from the inside, is a long cylinder of smoke. These craft that we're talking about, this technology, and a number of other technologies that they use, including plasma beams, all rely on what you're going to see here. This is a wrinkle. A smoke ring is not a series of spinning you know, things around this point here. It is a wrinkle like you would put in a carpet by doing that and making a wave go through the carpet, except it's in three dimensions and wrapped around. So as a result, when a smoke ring moves through the clear air, it absorbs clear air on the periphery of it in a layer that goes in, in, in to the inside and then does a reversal like uh, yin and yang and comes out pushing smoke ahead of it. And so a shell of smoke, a shell of smoke, a pipe, comes out the back. These things here are a rough approximation of what makes an atom or an electron. They are not particles. They are waves in a medium. All right. I have made them bounce off each other like particles, shooting them rapidly so that they hit and bounce, bounce off of tables and still keep their shape. These are why scientists think that light acts like a particle and like a wave, and so physicists say, well, let's call it a wavicle. It's because it has periodic motion, uh, yet it defines a very tight field like a particle would. This is a device that I uh, use to do the rest of what you're going to see here. It's a plastic pipe, um, mm, plexiglass pipe, and uh, I've just made it so it'll make smoke rings with a piece of um, shower cap uh, stuck on the back as a rubber membrane, and I pull it and pop it loose, and I get 70 to 90 miles an hour out of the little donut. Same thing you can do. You're going to see here uh, in a bright section uh, where I have a smoke cloud, an oil, an oil vapor cloud, and I shoot a clear air toroid through it, and you will see a perfect black, subtle, perfect circle go through it. This is why when UFOs go through clouds or various other things, you see nothing. 
they open it up like a, the, the mitral valve in the heart. They go like that, and they just cut a hole and close it right behind them. They don't make any swish, any wake, nothing. No sound wave, no sound barrier. That's because of what you're seeing here. Now watch closely, it's subtle, did you see it? Didn't see my hand move, did you? Right in the center, down the bottom. There you go, you see? See, now I've slowed it up so you can see how I've reversed it back and forth. Watch how it acts like a valve. Okay. A couple more just to show you. It doesn't really do a lot of damage. In fact, when I've fired these things across a room like that, I've had candles 30 feet away over on this side here because candle flame is very sensitive uh, you know, to motion. And I'll have the candle flame over there and shoot that way. And as the donut passes like this, the candle flame goes and bows toward the, the donut passing. The shock wave is there, but the energy stays in the center. It's a very, very efficient thing. Now, here's that mitral valve thing I was talking about. Clear one going through like that. See how it cuts a perfect hole? If you have a ship like that, it does that with gravity. It does it with uh, clouds. It does it with water. Um, fascinating, isn't it? So what do we do in the evenings at home? Tell you what, my wife is going to kill me if I keep playing with that Coke bottle because sometimes on the computer I'll take a ruler and I'll snap it like that and make these little beads form and I'll go thump, 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 thump. So if you do it another time, I'm going to shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> True, isn't it, Holly? <laughs> All right, now, I took some notes at one of the meetings because we weren't allowed to uh, film or record anything in one of my uh, briefings. All right in one of my briefings um, in the project here. And what you're going to see is a page of my notes here, um, which show what I was, I was drawing, what I was being shown, um, with the top off of the 30-foot diameter craft and with one of the sections removed so I could see inside the inductor. And this is uh, what I uh, put down on paper that day. You can see the, um, the arch I was telling you about is there. It's exaggerated a bit, it's a little thinner. Uh, the core section here with the, uh, the uh, main ring toroid. Uh, this one here with a, uh, like a Faraday cage, it wasn't exactly that, but that's what it's for. This uh, also held the superstructure onto the top of the craft. And there you can see some more of it there. I had correspondence and, and talked with a man named Townsend Brown and also got a hold of his uh, lab film from uh, the Bonson Corporation in 1958. I have one of the only two copies in existence. And I discussed the Philadelphia experiment and a number of other things with uh, Dr. Brown when he was in Catalina Island, California before he died. Um, Townsend filmed here was um, at the Bonson Corporation uh, in Salem. and. Uh, at that time, he was trying to generate anti-gravity uh, using the bifuel brown effect. Um, he had failed to, s to understand that you have to recirculate your wake like a smoke ring. So he was trying to do brute force, as many of them are still trying to do. But with a smoke ring and with charged particles, if I push out this way and the wake of my pushing comes around behind me into my intakes and adds to my energy, I use a lot less energy to go forward. In fact, it's like going, I, I reckon it's like going into a, a saloon bar in the Wild West. Break your boots and your guns and you come up to the saloon door, it's packed. Hello bar, I'm here! And you shove the door open, you're going to get a little resistance. But if you come up to the thing and you open the door, it's packed, it's, excuse me fellas, could I just move in here? No resistance in essence and you get in. So what you do is you make a place for yourself in the air or in a gravitational field before you get there. You scoop out a hole. You put yourself in it and it closes behind you and there's no pushing wake, there's no sound barrier, there's no light barrier in fact. We can go many times the speed of light using this concept in space. Brown tried a toroid coil in his, I've got his lab notes, his books as well, lab books. Uh, over here it was called the, uh, the beta uh, machine, this was generating his high voltage 100,000 volt charges that were generating these arcs on this. This saucer here, I've held it, it was about three feet in diameter. This coil, he would slip on top of that and they would put high charge through it, but it was only half 
of the solution. If he had done the other coil and had known to do it, where he wrapped it another coil like this, and put those in phase, he would have had anti-gravity in a big way. He was that close, that close. I have a great deal of respect for the work that Dr. <coughs> Brown did. And I, as I say, I'm privileged to have access to all of that stuff. This is some of his note work on the board um, for the design of the craft. Some of his vacuum testing on the lower left and uh, some of the high voltage testing before they put the coils on the top. <coughs> and that is a real deal. That's not an animation and that was just finished last week in California by one of our associates. We are making working models of these things to show you. So it is real. You can do it. Chris Craw did that. The government, per se, has little say in it. This was a supranational operation. My control agent in Australia was Sir John Williams, a Welshman, um, Captain Sir John Williams. He's now deceased. Um, and he was under the, uh, uh, the advice or counsel of uh, Dr. Edward Teller. In Russia, Teller's counterpart was Dr. Uh, Andrei Sakharov. Uh, I forget who the guy in West Germany was, uh, or in England, Norway, Canada but there, there were a few guys around. Anyway, these sat above uh, elected governments because elected governments come and go and they leak like a sieve. So, uh, well, they do. And uh, these gentlemen that I worked for were the invisible government you speak of, the Illuminati. And uh, we parted ways after it only been in the program for a short while, but, uh, and they also tried to put me at the bottom of a mine shaft about 5,000 feet deep. Now, I did manage to get away, obviously, uh, but they did manage to keep me out of the United States and telling you any of this for 30 years. Uh, they just gave me my citizenship and passport back in 2001. I spent 30 years in Australia waiting for the time to come back. There's a lot more to the story. Obviously, in one hour, I can't do that. So I'm hitting the highlights of this, and now I'm going to go very quickly to... Am I, what's my time like? I can't read this watch. How much time have I got left? Five, oh, five or ten minutes. All right. Uh, all right. Let's um, we'll skip one section here, and we'll go to free energy. There are a couple of things: the anti-gravity, the alien card, and free energy that people have been banting around, wanting to know how you do it and where it is. And there's all kinds of stuff about zero-point energy and magic this and over unity that, and nobody's come up with a working product for you. Well, they've had working product since the mid-50s. There are two main sources of this quote-unquote free energy. It's cheap, but it's not free. The sun is one of them. The sun hits on what's called the, the mm, plasma sphere or magnetic field of the Earth, a magnetosphere. Every planet except uh, Venus has one. Dr. Tesla over here in 1935 oh, or so patented a flat plate with an antenna pole underneath it going down to a couple of little things to a battery and a little motor to capture direct energy from the sun and turn it into electricity. Now his device did work, but it took you know, several hours to charge up a battery and it wasn't really efficient to run your home with. So after that, there was a young fellow um, following Tesla and his work. Uh, let me just go back on that one here. Oh, don't do that to me. Okay, all right, um, uh, here we go. Tesla, um, okay, as I said, developed that thing in 1935 and patented it sometime around then, patented, whatever. And in the steps came a guy named T. Henry Murray, who was a doctor in his own right, but a doctor of something else not related to free energy. But he knew that Tesla's work had merit. And so as a 19-year-old at the turn of the century, He'd been following Tesla. He started playing with um, antennas, insulated wires on the farm where he lived. He was a Mormon fella, a uh, kid. And he found out that he could get little arcs off of this antenna that was insulated from the rest of the house uh, through a little coil in his speaker, and it was novel. Years passed, he remembered it. And eventually, through time and circumstance, he spent some time in Sweden, a guest of some of his relatives there. And there was a train car came by with um, ore 
and some of the ore would drop off uh, when they'd stop at the uh, signal there at the tracks. And so as a kid, he would, a young man now, he would pick it up and take it home and collect it. He kept it with him when he went back to the States, went back home. And when he started playing with his um, uh, peculiar electric uh, discharge, his antenna, whatever, he used some of this Swedish stone, he called it. And it was a semiconductive type material, which we've now dubbed the triboluminescent material, which is just a strange term for saying it'll turn certain frequencies of light or heat into electricity directly. And he managed to build a device with um, about an 80 foot, uh, 85 foot long antenna insulated behind his house on two poles and a little wire coming off of it insulated again, down to two boxes about the size of this trolley here in his home. He could extract from uh, the ambient medium, the air, he could extract about five to uh, 7,000 watts of power continuously, run his home, uh, run a heater, and do it to witnesses, let him take his boxes apart, all except one little cigar box thing about that big, which held the uh, magic um, device which made it all work. And basically all he had in his box was a tuned Tesla coil system, a high voltage coil, a step down coil, and a couple of little feedback coils, and a radio circuit, a heterodyning circuit. No one would help him. In the uh, early 70s, he finally died, and his last words to his family were, why didn't they help me? In fact, they tried to assassinate him. Somebody shot at him through his, uh, his home window one time. There are so many documented cases on record of this man with sheriffs, judges, everybody reputable. And, and as I say, he was part of the Mormon community, and he was reputable. Showing him, proving that this worked, help me, he says, and we can develop you know, free energy for the world. And then it died with him. Now, his son, John, I talked to him. John didn't pay much attention to it. He was too young at the time and doesn't remember how dad did it. Just remembers conversations and something about germanium cells and this and that. That's not the issue. The issue is where was he getting the energy from? We'll use modern technology and get it. Well, this did happen in the mid 50s, as I said. The sun throws out particles at around um, 400 to 1200 kilometers per second, pretty fast million or two million miles an hour, something like that. I forget what the exact figure is, but it's, it's huge. And that hits us all the time, sprayed off from the sun. We get hit all the time from particles that are called uh, baryons and leptons, high-speed cosmic energy from other galaxies and other star systems, all the time hitting us. They're hitting everything, but we're getting our fair share of it because we're in the neighborhood. All these things strike a magnetic bubble around the Earth. As I said, every planet and some of the moons of, of Jupiter has a bubble like this, except for, for Venus, and it might have one once it settles down and spins the right direction. This guy here, Moray, tapped into a way to sit on the ground here with some insulated wires and reach out uh, electronically, if you wish, and feel the pressure of that solar wind as it vibrated at sometimes 30 million times of a second when a particle hit it have an impulse of a 30 millionth of a second, bang, like that. So much energy in it that some of those particles go straight on through the Earth. They're huge. And he said, you know, I noticed that my energy drops off from this coil about 20% at nighttime, but it still runs at night. Well, no direct sunlight. It's because of this magnetopause that we will look at here. This, uh, the little brown thing in the middle there next to those dark blue circles, right here, that's Earth. And this is the field, the magnetic field of the Earth as it moves through that solar wind. It gets bent around like a coma around a, a, a comet. And if you can imagine this being like a, a charged balloon full of charged air, and there's things beating on it like that all the time, at any one point in time, say in a 30 millionth of a second, roughly speaking, there's going to be a number of particles that are hitting, and there's going to be a number of rebounds from just being hit. And the net of those two is some energy for you. So if you can rake off that, that energy for that fraction of a second, then you've got that energy trapped down in your little device and the system doesn't know anything about it. It fills a hole with some more energy from more par uh, particles from the sun. Now, where we went a while ago is, is uh, where we belong now. This is the, the Van Allen belts, the radiation belts around the Earth, the outer one and the inner one. As particles hit it, oh, yeah. As particles hit it, it rebounds like this and it presses on the, the red one down there, which then presses on the surface of the Earth. What we do is build a charged 
pocket of air on the surface of the Earth with these wires. And when they get pushed on, they're going to make voltage. And how do we know this? Professor John Trump um, at uh, MIT, he's now de deceased as well, I wrote about him in my book, made a most remarkable discovery uh, in the 50s again with high voltage. Two plates there. Those two plates represent 10 inches by 10 inches metal plates. They're in a very high vacuum. And he has the ability to measure the attractive force between these plates when he puts a charge on it. So he said to me, and I went to see John before he died, he said, I put 300 volts per centimeter, that's a term for the, 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 the field intensity, I put 300 volts per centimeter between these plates and I measured the force at five ten thousandths of a pound. Bugger all, not much at any way. So then he says, I raised it to 30,000 volts per centimeter, only, only raised it 100 times, but yet the force is now up to half a pound, a thousand times more. So he said, well, I wonder what happened if we could go to the limit of our equipment to three million volts per centimeter. Watch this. Five and a half, well, 5.7 thousand pounds of force between two plates, 100 square inches each. Now, the outer atmosphere, that green envelope you just saw and the red one, those are our plates. And we've got, the Earth is, is part of it, the whole system, there's three plates involved. When you move these plates, he found, back and forth mechanically, the voltage started to, to, to change, just moving the plates closer or, or further apart. That top figure up there started to vary. If you've got varying voltage, you've got energy. And this was what he was tapping. Now, that is one source. The other source is what's called thermionic. It takes heat from your body, heat from the air. That is then processed through what is called a triboluminescent substance. And it simply means it's like the phosphor on your TV. The phosphor gets hit with an electron gun and it emits light of a certain frequency. But if you hit that phosphor with that same frequency of light going the other way, it makes electricity come out the other side, photoelectric effect. All atoms uh, in our part of the universe share energy between each other in what's called the infrared spectrum, the heat spectrum. So if you get a material that is responsive instead of to visible light, but to the invisible infrared radiation, then that will convert to electrons on one side of this material, and we put what's called a tuned circuit in a, in a cavity, just like Moray did, and it will strip mine those extra energetic electrons off and into a little spark gap and down to recharge your battery. So those two types are free energy, and there are people working on it uh, in a network that I'm a member of in France and here uh, in uh, Mexico and Australia and elsewhere probably, but the, the main part of our membership is in those countries. We are able to succeed uh, with what we've got to varying degrees, but basically if you use the atmospheric one I told you about, this one here, you'll be able to trap mechanical pressures on the, the outer um, uh, Van Allen belt and turn them into electricity and charge batteries, which you then run uh, inverters from, and you've got power to run your home without the power company. Obviously, one of the reasons it has not been widely distributed. Uh. By the way, the thermionic uh, device, um, if you take a nuclear, there are certain types of nuclear reactions you can make that produce a lot of infrared or heat energy. And if you do that inside of a material, uh, of, a, of a vault that's lined with that tribal luminescent material, you can convert that heat from that nuclear reaction straight into electricity, which, um, it may or may not be um, what uh, Bob Lazar was talking about when he talked about his, uh, his alien sport craft he saw with the three gravity wave focus machines out at Area 51. He did describe something uh, which I believe to be what we use ourselves. So whether they use an element 115 and, and bombard it with neutrinos and get heat out of it or whatever, they're actually taking heat, like I'm telling you, and converting it straight into electricity. To a certain degree, solar silicon cells do the same thing for us in solar collectors. Um, oh, come on. This is the backyard. I've just uh, got two more holes to fill and put the poles up and we'll be testing this out in our backyard. That's the charged antenna. You put uh, an insulated wire, insulate it to 30 to 40,000 volts so it won't leak into the atmosphere and you charge it up and it becomes your balloon to be compressed by the impact on our outer um, ionosphere and uh, Van Allen belt. Yeah. 
All right. Um, hmm. All right, look, I'm not going to explain this. I'm just going to show you uh, some of the uh, water and aircraft that I have made and tested here since that time and some I'm working on now. Um, they cycle at about every five seconds. This one uh, was something that I made for a DARPA proposal for a micro um, aerial vehicle for surveillance. Um, this was along the same lines. They weren't accepted, by the way, um, so there's nothing secret here. These all employ the principles of vortex spins in uh, uh, air or charged air. This is another one we built in Australia, uh, stateside. By the way, the real things weren't quite as pretty all the time. They had scuff marks and things on them, but anyway, this gives you the idea. And some of them were made out of uh, different materials, fibers, composite, and things like that. All of these have definite reasons for their design. And that's a plasma craft with the ion peaks on the center vortex, as I've discussed, uh, discussed with you before. Okay, that's probably enough for today. Uh, let's see, have we forgotten anything? Smoke rings, that, that, that. Okay. That's it, folks.